Thank you very much for coming, everybody, to this very warm summer afternoon. And uh, I would like us to begin today's Dharma talk with reciting the Om Nam Mantra, the universe in its purity, seven times. as money, fame, sex, food, and sleep. These are the five poisons or five sicknesses that human beings have as per the Buddha's teaching. But if you look at it very closely, without these five, most people cannot live. So how can we call that the five poisons? What is their nature? What is their function? In fact, why does it belong to us human beings? So these are questions that it is good to ask in a very fresh and uncontrived manner. Because if you ask the right questions, you get the right answers. You know that. So why do we have these five? Well, we couldn't even be born without them. Sometimes they are called the five desires, sometimes the five sicknesses, or the five poisons. In what relation do they become poison? They can become poison if you want to be free from them. If you want to attain awakening and liberation, they can become a hindrance. But if you want to work against them, you can't even live. How would you live without sleep or food? You can live without money, fame, and sex, but how can you live without food and sleep? So, those people who are practicing very hard, sometimes they can live with very little food and very little sleep. In fact, that's what we call suhain, okay? But uh, it's also very clear that if you completely do not eat, you soon die, maybe a few months, even if you take enough liquid, you soon die. There are young men Jonjins, 7 days, 21 days, without sleep. Yeah, we say no sleep, but if you try, even 3 days or 1 day, no sleeping, you know that you doze off. Your body needs it. Your mind also needs it. So once it belongs so much to our existence, how can we deal with this? My suggestion is that we look at them in the way they truly are. Okay? If you go to a forest because you like mushrooms, you like like fried mushrooms, you want to eat them. If you pick the right mushroom, it becomes very good bosot chongol, right? <laughs> Especially if you find so many bosot, very precious. Just a few of them cost, you know, Shipman on some shipman, very expensive. But if you pick the wrong mushroom, that takes you for a ride or kills you. So, how do you find the right mushroom? You have to understand which mushroom does what. In other words, in the case of the five desires, which one does what? So, if you stop being too passionate about it, whether you love them or hate them, you can see them very clearly. 
So right away I can talk about the medicine. The medicine, partially, is a non-judgmental, clear, undistorted consciousness. So once we start to mention the five desires, we have to mention the antidote right away. The antidote is a mind that doesn't think in terms of good and bad, right and wrong, holy and unholy, but sees things completely as they are, including the five desires. So what are they doing? What are they good for? What are their functions? How can you really not harm yourself and harm others with it? Help yourself and help others with it. Okay? We do not have to go step by step all the five of them. You can follow them in your mind as I speak of the view. If you want to enter this building, usually you come through the door. No one wants to come through the wall. Right? Even if you're a Taoist magician, you tend to come through the door. So, if you look at the five desires, what are they a gateway to? In other words, where do they lead? And what are they a wall to? When do they become a hindrance? So earlier I mentioned if you want to attain liberation from birth and death, then most of them, especially the fame, sex, money type of thing, they become very much of a hindrance. And soon we will try to understand deeper why. But they are gateways to lifestyles that people love. So here in Korea, many times you say, ah, this and this is a very famous person. <laughs> Fame. What does that really mean? Many people know you. Many people have an opinion on you. Sometimes some people help you. But many times you are just an asset in people's consciousness when you become famous. And most famous people want to use their fame to, in to influence people's minds. So what does it really bring, fame? A type of bondage which nothing else can bring. Mental superiority, as it appears on the outside, and a very dangerous position, as it really is on the inside. Public opinion is like a set of dominoes. One starts to fall, everything can follow. And it's very hard to make them stand up again and see the person in the right way, in the right light again. Fame is based on partial information. Fame is based on polarity, and many times fame is based on anger, desire, and ignorance. Since dualistic life has the five desires, they cannot be separated from anger, desire, and ignorance. It depends how you look at them. You look at the three kinds of causes, or the five kinds of effect. You know, how desire might manifest. If you're married, desire is part of your life. If you're a monk or a nun, you definitely have to give that up. So, if you don't have desire, you cannot keep your married life together. That's also very clear. But if you have desire and you want to leave that round behind, then it becomes a wall, not a gateway. Okay? What's common about all the five, including food and sleep? Okay? They become a bondage. So we talk about sensory perceptions and bound to the, to the senses. In other words, we are sentient beings. We have a body and we have a mind and they are linked together. But the five desires talk about the links, the bondages that this body and mind can have to other human beings and to this world. And that's why they are so important. So how do you want to relate to other people? Do you want to be their friend? Do you want just to be someone they don't know or somebody that everybody knows? So that's the term of fame. That's a relationship to other people. But what does it really mean to you or them? Ladies and gentlemen, fame is an image that doesn't exist. Not only can it change overnight, 
it may not have been true from the very beginning. It's like a mountain which seems only blue from the distance, but as you go closer and closer, it turns out that the mountain is not really blue. It's the sky and the oxygen around it that was blue. And as you go closer, the mountain turns green, because there are trees on it, and the trees are green. And as you go even closer, there are paths and rivers and lakes and clearings and forests. So the mountain stops being the blue mountain, but it shows you what it really is. A human being is exactly like that. You go to the other four objects of desire, like food. Food can appear very nice on the menu, or on the internet, or on the packaging. But you open it up, or you order it you know, during your restaurant stay with your friends, and then you get the real food. Even that is just an appearance because you eat it and hmm, <laughs> so it turns out there's a lot of new one in it. So it's not real taste. That food is also illusory. Then you get a big headache. You know, oh, I have to drink more water. If you eat more me one, you have to drink a lot of water, otherwise big headache. Same thing with sleep. Sleep you think makes you and rested and relaxed because when you're tired you sleep but with what kind of mind do you go to sleep if your mind is clear then your mind can rest during sleep but every one of you at least for a short time in your lives you had nightmares very bad dreams sometimes very good dreams but when you wake up it's your mind not your sleep time that determines what kind of rest you got did you get some real rest or you were turning around, around, around. Or if you have a husband and wife, you were kicking them because you had such a nightmarish experience. So what kind of mind do you have during sleep? That's what determines it. So sleep is not good or bad. But one thing is clear. During sleep, you have no awareness. If you don't practice, you have almost zero awareness. We barely remember our dreams. If you practice, and your mind turns into some really bad mode and you have very bad dreams, your practicing mind kicks in. So those who do a lot of yongul or mantra, they can experience this during their dream time and something ugly appears and kwan just starts to vibrate in your consciousness and you start to say it although your body is asleep. Okay? That's why kids love tales because the tale remains in their minds as an image and the good characters in the tales, they drive or guide the children's consciousness through the night, through their own dreams. That's why telling tales to children is so important. Okay. Money. Everybody wants it. But those who have a lot, they can tell you what a big burden it is. First of all, if you are known to be a rich person, it's like being castigated. It's like being marked. Even if you don't have a Porsche or a Lamborghini standing in front of your house, even if you don't own two palaces in Kangnambu and you know, uh, Dong, even if you live a very modest lifestyle, people learn that you are rich. And then they start to say, how did this person get his or her money? How did that happen? So, envy appears. Okay. We talk about the five desires and their repercussions and the reaction that people have to it. And you have to put the two of them together. Okay. But if we understand the true nature of money, we are not attached to it. And we don't really want to keep it. Because who would want to have frozen food? Tons of frozen food in the pantry. Who would want to have unfulfilled dreams at night? Who would want to have many, many people worshipping them, but not really one friend, not really one meaningful relationship? So money is like that. Money is frozen energy. It's the frozen energy of a lot of people's work and service, and just owning a stack of banknotes or assets or portfolio or securities, it doesn't mean anything. It means one thing. You have material power. You have a lot of potential. 
And wherever you put your money, that's where this energy materializes. You can give jobs to people. Also, you can do a lot of harms by buying weapons and selling them to fighting countries. You can finance charity projects. You can live well and you can totally, absolutely go the wrong way if you use your money just for personal purposes. So, five great potentials. And they can turn through the desire energy and the anger energy over ignorant ways into the five poisons and the five sicknesses. So in the title we said, One Medicine. It seems like a little bit of an overpowering, big problem on the sickness part, because we have five of them. And we have only one medicine. What is that? The only medicine is your awakened consciousness. The only medicine is your Buddha nature, and to the extent you realize it, to that extent you can control the five desires. Because if you cannot, then these desires control you. And to the extent that you have problems in your life, in your own mind, in your own heart, in your relationship, in your work, in your bank, to that extent, one or more of the five desires are out of balance and they control you. Some of them may not be visible because we are experts at hiding them. Human beings are very good at not putting a nice face on outside, and yet on the inside something's burning, or many things are burning. So practice really begins looking inside, and don't think of the great quadu when you ask, what is this? Just look at your own mind, your own heart, and ask, what's going on? What is this human being really that wants to look so nice in the mirror and wants to appear perfect in the outside realm and wants to appear as a rich and famous and desirable, well-fed and well-rested you know, person when everything is in perfect order? What is that? And if you really look at yourself very clearly, what kind of energies you have, what kind of desires or aversions you have, then it's one step closer to awakening. And in terms of the five desires, awakening means seeing them as they truly are. I mentioned this before today, but what does it really mean? We want these five things because we somehow, deep inside, believe that they bring us absolute pleasure or constant well-being, some kind of liberation from our problems, etc etc and it's not just the Buddha's teaching it's other great teachers teaching that these five sense areas or five desires they are relative they are imperfect they are interdependent and impermanent so they are not absolute it's not what we think we are they don't bring the results we always expect them to bring Sometimes the biggest shock in a family's life is the coming of a newborn baby because they have no idea what it is. There are mothers in this room. Can you remember when your first child was born? Was it what you expected? It's a wonderful experience, most mothers tell me. For some, it's not that wonderful. But how it is, how your heart reacts to the coming of your baby depends on what you expected before based on your knowledge and what you actually got in your experience. So, with a bold move, I suggest that you listen to your experience. What kind of mushroom you got in the forest really decided in the stomach as you have eaten it, and as you are digesting that mushroom, the effect comes back, either as a good song was or something that makes you dizzy or have a trip or have to go to hospital to clean out your system, otherwise you die. So listen to your experience. Not your ideas. Especially not your ideas of good and bad. But listen to your experience, how you experience the five desires. What do they really mean to you? And in that sense, put down your own expectations. Put down other people's expectations. 
and then you can truly see them as they are. And when you have done that, you have done not just a great favor to yourself, but also to others. Why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, we believe we are so smart. Most human beings have this cerebrum, and we can think and speak and make abstract systems and, you know, all kinds of cognitive, you know, magic. But still, this is a very, very small part of our existence. We believe that we are thinkers in a body, but rather we are feelers that think. So much more of our existence is physical and emotional, a very, very small fragment is cognitive. But that's the loudest. Your thinking is the loudest and the fastest and the most aggressive and the most ambitious. And most importantly, it's your thinking that says I. So that I controls everything else. Or so it seems. I is just a mask. I is just a box. Although illusory, we want to put everything under this heading. Me. My life, my welfare, my satisfaction, my fame, my restedness or you know, all kinds of good things. So we are looking for happiness through the five desires and as we grow up we realize you can't get it. You can get very temporary small spikes of pleasure or material welfare or some rest, or anything that you originally desired as permanent, but it's not going to happen. Waking up to the true nature of all these desires is the only way. And why does it take so long? Because we are so much used to it. So badly used to it, that no one is an exception. I tell you a story. A long time ago, in Korea, there was a very famous sutra temple. And the sutra temple had a very famous sutra master. And uh, one day, his disciples gently kind of asked him a Zen question, and he couldn't answer. So he decided to go on a long pilgrimage. Usually three years is the longest that these senior monks are away. So he left the temple to the vice abbot and he said, okay, I am going with some of my Zen students to meditate Ango, both Ango and Dongango, here and there. And after some time, maybe one to three years, I come back to my temple. But as he was leaving, and he went up on a mountain slope with all the luggage and all the you know, retinue, the other people, Sometime, before he lost sight of the temple, he looked back and he saw that the temple was on fire. And he got frightened and he stood and told him, Sunim, don't go back. Everybody else, hundreds of people are handling it. Your bicep that handles it. You must go. We are with you. We help you. Please come with us. Let's practice. The old abbot just couldn't listen. His heart was so fused with the temple's well-being, his existence was so dependent on it before, that he said, no, 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 I can't do this. It's like breaking my heart. So he went back to the temple, helped to put, put out the fire, and of course stayed there for the restoration, did another big busa for the day we joined, and then, he stayed there and he says, maybe that was my purification. And he stayed and never went to meditate. But his students, nearly all of them returned because they were loyal to the only one who suggested that he should go. He went nonetheless. In a year, this old monk died. And when there was the 100 day ceremony, everybody came. Because, you know, news travels a little slowly without internet and email. So everybody understood 
the abbot's passing after a few weeks or a few months, so everybody could come for the 100 day ceremony. And this younger monk, who practiced very hard, he came, and he was part of the great Namo Amitabha chanting, and he was very sad. He perceived that his sunim, that his juji sunim, was not going the right place. So after the ceremony was over, he went behind the altar, he took a bowl of juke, and he placed it behind the Buddha statue. And from under the altar, soon there was a big black snake coming up, and ate the juke right away, right away. And then this disciple took out his knife and immediately killed the black snake. And there was a cloud coming up from the carcass of the snake and traveling around the village near the temple. And the young monk followed it. And suddenly the cloud was taking the shape of a cow and almost entered the stable or the cow shed to a very rich peasant's house. And then the Zen monk, the ex-disciple, shouted, Oh good! Then the cow disappeared. Then there was a formation of bird, a big bird. It started to fly away towards the mountain, towards a nest, a big, big bird's nest. Then the young monk shouted, No good! Then it started to take the shape of a dog and drift back towards the temple. Very near the temple, you know, there are these houses and there's a lot of jindoke around. <laughs> Long time ago, same. But as it was taking the shape of a dog, the student also shouted, No oh, good! So a dog also dispersed. The cloud started to take the shape of a human being and landed in a house. And that was something that the disciple noted where it was and returned to the temple. Two years later, this disciple went to the house where the cloud landed, found the parents, and found a young boy who was always sick. And that time when this boy was found, he was so sick that he was near death. So he said to the parents, I'm so sorry. You are grieved, and I grieve with you. But your son may die. Why don't you give him to the Buddha? Make some good karma for him and for you. And if your son becomes healthy, I bring him back to you. So the parents agreed. There was no miracle at that time. Even now, there's not much. But at that time, if a child got sick, before the body and mind became strong, it was near certain death. So they gave up the child. And Dol Um, that's the name of the monk, Dol Um took the child, took him to the temple, raised him as a young little monk. Some of them you can see in temples, they already have abbot's face and they're only five years old. <laughs> this young, young Sami learned everything right away. And when the time came, Dol Um, who was by then a little bit older, he said to this young monk, he was about 10, 12 years old, put him to a room, put a screen, you know, this paper screen, rice paper screen, with a little hole on it, and he said, you get a little food twice a day, and for a hundred days you must watch this hole and ask, when does the big cow come through? When does the big cow, all day, you ask this question yourself, okay? So, so he's sitting there all day looking at it. So this wadu stopped being just words. I already talked about it many times before. Wadu practice begins with words. But as your question deepens, the words disappear 
and the true question appears which has no words and no speech and no thinking. That question opens your mind into infinite space like a mirror. That's what it becomes. So on the hundredth day, this young monk, still looking at the screen, suddenly sees his big cow appear right through the hole becoming this huge cow and then he shouts master master I see the cow I see the cow so Dolum comes in and slaps the boy and suddenly the cow disappears then the boy wakes up and he says you were my student and Dolum then bows <laughs> and he says sir welcome back so that's a little story how you can wake up, even from such a subtle desire as helping a temple or attached to sutras, which is just a little cognitive thing. It's a little bit attachment to thinking. Now imagine that you are attached to something much more sensual, stronger, where the mangsam, the illusion, is much thicker. So this, this story of Dolum tells you very clearly and that we have to do something, we have to disengage from these five desires and not just the five, the others also. The five desires are just areas. He doesn't really talk about how much we are attached to dualistic thinking. It may belong to fame, okay? But we love to talk, we love to think, we are totally in love with our self-image. And that's what creates this bondage which eventually turns us into a black snake or worse. So as we move along over the four more occasions, we will examine how these five desires work, not just at an individual level, which today we talked about briefly, how it works in the family, in the country, and on the face of this earth. Just like before we talked about individual karma and group karma. And now what's going to be, I think, very interesting is how these five desires work at the group and nation and whole global level and what we can do with it. So I think for today this is enough for an introduction. And I see in the eyes that maybe you already have some questions. So I would like to welcome those questions. If you have any, please ask. Rukami, coming, don't hold yourself back. Go ahead. Sometimes you says everybody has good nature, but also you have to take all responsibility for your life and your practice. Mm -hmm. Who does have good nature? Who does take responsibility for their own life? Who is asking the question? Uh, I is a mistake, don't know is good. <laughs> so keep don't know. But this don't know is not dummy don't know. <laughs> dummy don't know is... <laughs> <laughs> this is not the don't know we are talking about. <laughs> this is dumb dumb. <laughs> so don't know is not pabo, it's different. <laughs> Don't know means no thinking. So you ask, where does all this come from? Buddha nature, everybody's an adult here. Buddha nature doesn't exist. It's a good concept referring to your awakened consciousness. But that has no name, no form. So how can you call it Buddha nature? So Joju was asked a long time ago. And he started to teach. You know, Jojo didn't teach for a long time. Then he became ever. He was teaching for 40 years. He lived until 110. So he asked Jojo, mind and Buddha, same or different? So he, he says, mind is Buddha. Well, thank you very much. That means everybody has Buddha nature. Everybody is already Buddha. Everybody can be happy. Go drink tea and eat a lot of talk. No problem. But later they asked him, Mind and Buddha, same or different? Then Joji says, no mind, no Buddha. <gasps> Shock! No. So then this is a... Sir, with all due respect, why did you say many years ago that mind is Buddha, Buddha is mind? 
he says, so that the children wouldn't cry. Okay? So that's an answer to this illusory contradiction between Buddha nature, responsibility, cause and effect versus freedom, enlightenment, and still existing in this sentient body. Okay? The question was good. But I want you to see that awakening and responsibility are not two. Freedom and cause and effect are not two. And when you truly attain that, you can use cause and effect without recklessness or irresponsibility, also without a sense of being bound to something. When you and this world become one, it's not just awakening to something which is not cause, not effect. In other words, no life, no death. This don't know or this point. But it's also awakening what is life, what is death, what is cause, what is effect, what is body, what is mind. Okay? Simultaneous. Maybe one lasts a little longer than the other. Attaining true dharma is just 50%, but attaining karma right after that is the other 50% and sometimes tougher. Attaining liberation is one thing, but attaining the true nature of the five desires, that's also our job. Not being attached to it, but truly attaining what they are. Because if we don't, we might feel liberated, but we are still vulnerable. Because we are not wise enough, and you are not compassionate enough. And in terms of the five desires, compassion helps you more than thinking. Or cognitive wisdom. You can think very eloquently and wonderfully about the five desires, and you can read a lot of books and dharma, psychology, and whatnot about it. But that may not help, because when your passion overpowers you, it's very hard to think. But when that happens, and your passion becomes greater than your wisdom, you can do one thing. Put yourself immediately to the other person's position. So if you give way to your desire, what happens to the other person or persons? And that can stop you. If not, you go head on. Boom. Then you hurt yourself. So there is no contradiction between Buddha nature and cause and effect, liberation and responsibility. They are one and the same thing. This confusion means all previous ideas are taken away. Correct. Then you go on the internet and you listen to this again, then confusion disappears. <laughs> I trust that it will. More questions? Well, I wasn't a Buddhist for a long time. 
I just tried myself reading many books and trying so many different practices. But since she pushed me to do some readings and white dharma sutras, but I thought that oh, it doesn't work, Mom. I cannot. I will find my own way. But she, that's why she always felt somewhat sorry to me. But this year, I just decided myself to find one way through Buddhism. Still, I'm kind of confused because whenever I feel like, okay, I won't desire this kind of five Buddhism in my life. But still, I'm. I'm not married yet, but I will marry someday. So I have to find a good man for my future husband. And I also save some money for my just basic life, right? But if I try to focus on the spiritual things, like, oh, I should focus on attachment, no money, no thing that people say, but it's always confusing me. So I don't know how can I balance the two different things at once. Wonderful question <laughs> from a human being. That's great. You know, first of all, it's very, very difficult for us to realize that many times we do not have our self-image as a human being. Some people believe they are God or gods. Some people have very low self-esteem and say, oh, I'm worse than an animal, you know, this kind of stuff. But if you really classify yourself as human, it's the start. This is really important. It's like facing your situation head on, directly. Now you talk about spiritual experience versus work versus aspirations yeah. and your mother's wonderful presence here will help you on the path. Now, to come to family first, we are in Korea, family first. Without your mother, you wouldn't be here, neither physically nor mentally. So, of course, you have a very wonderful and respectful relationship to her, but it's your wonderful inyon that she's sitting right next to you here. And yeah, she sometimes pushes you. When you were young, she pushed a little food down your throat. <laughs> when you were older, she pushed some ideas into your brain. And, and look at the result. So the result is wonderful. Because what happened, and what parents actually realize sooner or later, that the kids can only make their own decisions. No one can make it for them. We can advise them, we can push them, we can argue with them, we can fight. That's OK. It belongs to life whatever we choose. But ultimately, children grow up, they become adults, and they make their own decisions. And you wouldn't be here without your own decision. So the two together, all the external impacts, you digesting them, making your decision to do what you really believe in, that's what brought you here. Now, spiritual experience versus the job, etc. You said you're a translator. You're talking to an ex-colleague here. I know what it means to translate 14 hours a day without a change. I know what it means to be so exhausted that you don't even have enough power to watch the remote control and push the button, you know, and watch something on the television because you're just dead. So, what you can do is run into nature. All the two words, both words, run and nature are important. Do some exercise, some jogging, because right after this big mental distress or burden or overwork, whatever you term it, you need to go and clean yourself out mentally. And do that with the help of your body. So first, physical exposure cleans out the mental junk. Everything, including the unnecessary sentences, the subject matter of your uh, written or verbal translation, all the judgments or feedbacks that people ever gave you on that day or before, put it into some physical movement. If it's bowing, it's fine. But it's sometimes not enough, especially indoors. You need nature. Why do people love to go to forests and lakes and uh, up the mountain and you see sometimes even Eight-year-old Ajuma going up the mountain with gold sticks, and, and you see this little, you know, bag of, you know, Toshirak right there, and this little water bottle, and they are there, and they are smiling and sweating, and there are three of them, and chip, 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 talking, talking. Why? Because it brings them this oneness with nature and a lot of energy, this clean, raw, undifferentiated energy. So that's what you can do. I could never, even when I was already a practitioner, 
and I was a university student or I had a job or I earned some money, you know, before Chulga, I could never practice right after that. It's too much, I'm too tired, I'm, I'm overworked, overworn. And yeah, you can do yombul, but the yombul is mixed with your thinking and it's bigger confusion and, and then you say, oh my god, I didn't sign up for this. If that's no suhang, I'm sorry. No, no, I don't want this. So then, intermediary phase, clean it out. Sports, dung san, nature, you name it. Just nothing artificial. So, yeah, sometimes people listen to music, or they eat, or they sleep, or do many other things to wipe the unnecessary content from their consciousness. But in this case, as long as your body can handle it, a good mountain walk, completely silent, just listening to the trees and the birds, or even the soul kyotong from Kukansa, that's also fine, no problem. So that's very natural, because ultimately this practice about Buddhahood or awakening is not something special or something artificial or something remote, it's about our true nature. That's why I really love the term Buddha nature, because it talks about awakening and something, nature, that we already have. So nature is our healer. Nature is our teacher. Nature is our true environment unless we kill her in our ignorance or detach from her in our desires and attachment. All this is all available to you within a 20-minute taxi ride or a bus ride, even if you live in Kanda. So we find some patch of nature, even if it's a park, but better come to a soul mountain. And then, with walking and silence and maybe some exercise, don't answer the phone. That helps. Okay, that's number one. And then, when the noise has subsided, or you feel that you are a little bit refreshed, then the first contact is some sutra, mantra, or chamsan. So let the mind settle. When the junk is out, let it become clear, collected. And then without effort, it becomes solid again. Ask yourself, did the diamond make any effort to become irresistibly strong and bright and clear? The diamond didn't, but hundreds of millions of years of sunshine did. Then it got some pressure, and as the old rainforest fell, it became coal, more pressure, graphite, more pressure, time. So as you digest your mental content, I don't mean to repress it artificially, I don't mean that. What I mean is when you settle everything, when you let things subside and calm down, it's really like the old trees of yesterday and last week, or even your previous life, the old trees going underground, becoming coal, becoming graphite, becoming time. So, exposure, erasure, composure, okay? And then, everything's gonna work. So you asked me, one other part in your question was, one day you will marry and you want to have somehow a balance in your life. So, the key word, which I will mention a few times in different contexts within the next you know, couple of weeks, is enough. So that's what he used to say, enough mind fish never touch fish hook. Now, that's in English. And we loved him for this. All of his teaching, in whatever way he said, concise, clear, directly pointing. Okay? So if you have enough, then your experience doesn't become a hook. It can include all the five desires. It can include everything that your life naturally comprises. I and mean, if you have a husband, then you live your life as a married woman. And everything, all inclusive, it has to work day and night. But what is enough? And then not just for you, for him. And to talk about just mm -hmm. everyday simple interaction, how much talking is enough? How much silence is enough? How much food is enough on the table? How much touch is enough at night? So if we don't perceive the other as first, and it doesn't become mutual, the relationship cannot stand. Because it always goes one way. 
only me first and the other maybe I notice if there is a problem I notice it before there is a problem okay. so that's what I mean by enough mind so enough mind and compassion they are side by side closely together because enough is not just for you enough is the other person also from the point of view of the other person now, if you keep that in mind, not small enough mind, but big enough mind, then you will make much fewer mistakes. Mistakes appear when we don't observe clearly, when we don't perceive clearly. Sometimes the other one's more, but we already say, I'm sorry, enough, thank you. But we don't dare to say it, because we do not want to displease the other. We don't want to make them feel bad. That's exactly how we make them feel bad, because we are not honest. We are not true to ourselves or the other one, when the other has enough, but we still want more. And we refuse to recognize it's there already, but you refuse to admit because you still so much enjoy it, you're attached to whatever you guys are doing, and then you still want, but the other says, oh, without words. The mind has already told you through the little okay, through the feeling, through the intuitive blip, that's it, that's enough. So if we are not sensitive, intuitive, in other words, clear-minded and open-hearted, we don't notice this and we don't see what's enough. And similarly, side by side this goes with beginning and end. Enough is really about the end, when something should stop. But right next to it, there's the beginning. Should I really begin this now or not? Should I open my mouth and talk? Should I say, there's food on the table, so now we eat, because it's 12 o'clock. But the other is not hungry. So then, you attach to your family schedule, or you say, okay, honey, we eat a little later. Simple thing, small thing, but when you live together with someone, or, in, or you live in a community, any kind of community, not just married life, any kind of community, you have to deal with these issues. And if we don't, we can reduce our life quality so much, so bad, that you even want to stop living like that. Okay. Good question. You're welcome. More questions? Any kind. told me that you were having a lecture at the library. Uh, I saw once uh, in the weekend, uh, I, I saw your lecture once in the internet, uh, but I felt it was very won wonderful, so I decided to come here. And uh, I felt the wiseness in, in you, so I wanted to bring some questions. I wanted to ask something I need to uh, I need to solve, but uh, I am trying to practice in my life, but I really can't. It's very hard for me to pull out what what do I really need to know or things like that. The, uh, I usually have problems with my Head headaches, uh, whatever I want to think, I get a lot of headaches. So I usually don't uh, stop thinking, and then I miss uh, the finding of what I really need to know or, or what I really need to uh, practice or things like that. So <laughs> that that's that's my question. What what? What do you think that I need to do if I want to find 
a good way in my practicing. Relax. Oh. Mind is too tight. It's so tight that I have to tell you a story. I was a kid. And my parents took me to the great Hungarian circus, which was a small circus. But usually there are horses, and animals, and clowns, and people flying up in the air. You know circus. Old style. Very funny. Children like it. <gasps> Amazed. And I would never forget one fantastic attraction. I remember that more than anything else. Over the years it came up. And uh, as I started to practice, it gained deeper and deeper meaning. So circus is circular, that's why it's called circus. In Latin it's circle. And there are many entrances, usually three or four. And through one entrance, two dwarves came in. A red dwarf and a blue dwarf. And they were already wrestling. And uh, they were so tightly kind of embracing and clutching each other that uh, they seemed totally inseparable and they were swaying each other left and right and back and forth and they gave out this really weird sound like, all kinds of sounds and, and this really strong struggle but they were extremely funny at the same time and they were going all around the circle sometimes kind of uh, hunching down and turning over and rolling and all kinds of stuff but they always stayed clutched together understand how can they never become separate? How can they kind of maintain this unity so much? So after a few minutes of really spectacular performance, the two dwarves went to the center of the arena, to the circle, and they stopped. And then the artist stood up. The blue dwarf was standing straight and the red dwarf was upside down. It was one artist in a totally bent position. One body, two dwarfs. And then I was like, wow! And he took off the mask, so the red dwarf was gone. And from the waist he was the blue dwarf down, and bowed and everybody hand clapped. I'll never forget this. So that's how illusion works. That's how your headache works because your thoughts are like these two dwarves, okay? Totally clutched together, absolutely attached to winning, losing, awakening, ignorance. So your practice, with all due respect to your efforts, is still thinking. So return to the point when the artist stood up and the dwarves disappeared. So that means before thinking, before moving. And when you do that, you can feel relaxed and clear and present at the same time. I suggest you go back to the very beginning. And since you have a headache, do a lot of Tanjon Ho, Tanjon breathing. And if your body is good enough, then bowing. You don't have to do fast bows. But during bows, don't do Yongbul, don't do Hwadu. So no chanting, no question during the bows. Just watch your breath. As you go down with the bow, breathe out. As you come up, breathe in and do this with open eyes nothing special in the mind just bow if you have a Buddha at home it's fine or you go to the temple you can also do that but if you have just your normal daily room which you are using that's also good have some chamel, some mat that's it if it doesn't work then you have to move more physically, so to move your energy around and not have it fixed so much in your cranium, in your cerebrum here. Bowing actually starts this orbit, this microcosmic orbit, in a very good direction. The energy goes down here and uh, it collects in your tanjong, also comes up at the back of your body. And uh, if it's not enough, you can do some sports, some jogging, anything, and then bow. And since you have a very skinny body, everything you think, even what you feel, immediately hits the chakras because there is no big muscles or other big body mass to hold your energy. Everything goes right to the place, okay, where the function is. So the heart is here, the mind is primarily here. So all your thinking right away hits your head. All your feelings right away hit your heart. 
So uh, don't let that happen. That's why we say Tanjun practice. Not, the, not just Tanjun or Tanjun breathing, but attention. You, you have Navi in the car, navigation system. There's always the same. <laughs> Pay attention to the bump. Attention to the curve. Attention to the speed limit. Attention to the policeman. So, Pay attention to your Tanjuan. Tanjuan Ho. Tanjuan Jui. Okay? So when you pay attention to your Tanjuan, then these centers are all relieved. But just by sitting, it's not going to happen soon. If you sit and your energy is still up, because you have too much thinking, too much feeling, then Sangi appears. Sangi very dangerous. It can fry the brain, it can overload the heart, it can do many things also in the speech chakra. If you uh, speak and then suddenly stop and you want to talk but you don't, all kinds of complications can appear here. This tightness in the throat and fear. So move. You have body. Move. And don't think. Thinking will never bring you anything. It brings you relatively good results. To translate, you have to use your head. And you do it. Just don't think it's good for anything else than that. <laughs> you can read these wonderful books, but still you have to digest them. You can practice the Dharma first with your reading mind, your cognition, your understanding. The understanding ultimately doesn't help you get, get awakening. But understanding is like the springboard. And from the springboard you can jump. But when you have jumped, you left the springboard behind. So, do it. If you do it, you get it. Okay? Yes. More questions? Any kind of question is good. And we don't have actually that much time. We have used our time really quickly. First you feel it, you touch it, so you know it's there. And then, you put the question to the same place where your palm is, on your belly button. It takes some getting used to. It takes some time. Usually we put the thinking here. That's why I say, if you're attached to the words of the Kwadu, you can never bring it down to the Tanja. And after a while, the sense of the question or I would say the root of the question stays in the tanja, but the words disappear. It's true, you, f you form your words here, you cannot think with your belly, you can have intuitive blips, you know, in your tanja. That's where your intuition just kicks in. It can manifest as feeling, it can manifest as thinking, but your thinking machine is up here. Okay, you don't have a cortex in your belly, fortunately. Okay, but you have gut feelings. You have intuition, you have insights. Okay. So you can do 
these exercises not just you know statically holding your hand on your belly but also what we call <coughs> so new or dharma play these are various exercises uh, which is like qigong or uh, some others but they are all focused on the tanjong so that you would have an awareness the feeling of the tantian or in korean tanjong and that's when the roots of the tree are stronger than the leaves for a tree it's very clear if the leaves become stronger then the roots die so the roots have to be stronger than anything else in the tree in other words your center must be stronger than your feeling center speech center thinking center or any of your senses okay if that is the strongest then your thinking, your feelings, your karma cannot control you. That's the function of Tanjong practice. We don't just follow something like the Buddhist, the Taoist, the Zen followers. All these people did because the Buddha and the great patriarchs also had the Mahamudra, they put it down here. We don't just do this before other because other people did that before us. We do this because it works. It has a good function. So when we do that, then everything starts to shift your view shifts your experience shifts your stability appears you can reflect you can detach you can perceive and in that mind space consider emptiness mind space in that mind space you can make decisions you discover you have choices if you're overwhelmed with your karma your feelings and your thoughts you believe you have no choice but in fact we have a choice moment to moment we have choice and choices that we make now if you're attached to your thinking your choices all but disappear except what you discover with your thinking if you're attached to your feelings then all your choices disappear except what you discover with your feelings but if your mind is clear and reflects everything everything then you always have a choice is this point clear that's why practicing is so important. So keep your tanjong the strongest center for your mind and for your body. And then you will lead a better life and you will die a better death. Also important. It matters a lot how we go. And it reflects how we live. Hold yourself back. If there's a nuclear test tomorrow, we may not meet next week. and make a war and 
doesn't care about other people's you know, pain or starving. And I think that, I mean, even though I don't like, my sister doesn't like, you know, very much spending time with other people. And I understand her, her what she's, what, what's, why she's like become, uh, like doesn't want too much interact with human being. Because I also thinking that even, even though we have a true Buddha nature, and in fact, this earth is influenced by our evil mind rather than our Buddha nature. When, when we open our eyes, we can see that what's going on in this, on this planet. Even when I look at focus on the Korean society here, I mean, we don't care about, you know, most of our uh, 90, even 1% of high, social high, high class, they only care about themselves. They don't care about 99% of Korean average people. You know, we're looking for a job, it's so hard. Even we got a job, they pay us like a peanut money. And, you know, for the group of people who call Jebel, they, they have all this, like, uh, more than, uh, more than 90 or 70 percent of asset in Korea. Mm -hmm. So um, this for a small thing and then when I look at the Africa, you know, the war and when I say that, it's really, I mean, even though we have true Buddha nature, the effect is something, I mean, I almost, my mind is I mean, even though I want to believe there is hope on this planet and hope in our Buddha nature, I feel that it's too late. Or and I feel that oh, human being is really less than the animal. <laughs> even though we we have to, it's so much somehow lucky that we were born as human being because we are in superior in like a. Because we control things here that we shouldn't, I think. We don't have any authority to control and think that this is ours. But everything, I don't think it's ours. Everything you say is wonderful, but let's come to the point of the question. Yeah. So my point is, instead of saying that we are Buddha nature, why we just acknowledge that human beings are awful? Okay, very you good. Know? Very good question. So let's not pretend we are so superior or we have some Buddha nature. Let's just think that we are shit, full of shit. So let's change it. Okay, <laughs> excellent, excellent. I very much appreciate the question and all the contribution you made during asking the question. So you said, let's acknowledge that we are shit. Yes. And then let's change it. Yeah. You said that. Yeah. So let me ask you, can shit change shit into something else? Well, shit can be used for growing no, the plant. don't divert from the subject. <laughs> we know what shit can be used for. But we're talking about human beings right now because you say we shouldn't feel so superior because we are doing so many bad things and you, you are absolutely right that we are doing all these terrible things to earth, to each other, everything, all other beings. If you consider that an identity, then you cannot change it. Because it's fixed. You say human beings are shit. Yeah, great. So then, can shit change shit? That means we stay like this. So if we say what we truly experience, then we can change it. We acknowledge it first. We perceive it. And then we can change it. Human beings have made much, much bad karma. It's true. So this whole earth cannot sustain us as we are. We would need three more earths, or at least two more earths, so that we could keep on growing and living like this, like this cancerous tissue, you know, which eats the forests and kills all the animals and hunts down all the fish and depletes all the resources. Everything you say is true. But that's just karma. It's not our true self. It's not our true identity. That's not 
simply equal to human beings. That's our habit, that's our karma, that's our compounded group activity, you name it. But that's not us. We have to take responsibility for this because we have done that and we have been doing that and we still keep doing that. But that's not our true self. If we didn't have a choice, we couldn't change it. But we had a choice. That means our consciousness is higher than just the karma that we make. It comes from our consciousness, but our true self is higher than that. We can perceive it. We can make one step back and start in another direction. So how, you may ask. Just like the answer before to our translator, we have to see as a group, and we are jumping ahead a little bit, that it's enough. So how much money is enough? The Chebo families, they have to see it. Also in America, the top 1% control 70% of the wealth of America. Top 1% of the population. So these big inequalities, these big immeasurable you know, suffering, these big inappropriacies and big suffering, by them, by, by themselves, they have no self-nature. In other words, they will never tell you that it's enough. Human beings, us who make it, we have to say that it's enough. And then we can change it. And uh, you say there is no hope. Yeah, there's no hope, but there's also no fear. So don't be afraid that at some point it may not come. Also don't hope that it will come anytime soon, because we are so blind as 7 billion human people, that before the system breaks, we do not want to change it. Okay? The best example now is really, look at the financial affairs of the world the last three years. What kind of immeasurable losses we had to suffer because of irresponsible fiscal behavior. It's terrible. It's terrible. And that means fake money and real money, they got mixed. And even the real savings, the real value, people's you know energy, they got wiped out. That's what we call real loss. Not just on the balance sheet, but that means people go to the bank and there's no money there because somebody just made the wrong decision. So you may ask, when does it stop? Well, it didn't get started by itself, so it will not stop by itself. We are the beginning and the end. In our minds, there is the beginning and at the end. And the end. So, this is really important to see. So when we say enough, it's enough. Otherwise, the ocean will never say, sorry, I have no more fish for you. But we will not find it. The earth will never say, I have no more arable land for you. It's just desert. But it will happen. It can easily happen. If you look at the oceanic map, all the, all the kind of fish density, how many tons per square, per square kilometer we had 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and now, it's frightening. We are depleting the oceans like never before. Even the mass extinctions couldn't do this 65 million years ago. We are incredibly good at this. So either we open our eyes, both as individuals, families, countries, and the global population, or not. And if we don't, we will suffer. And don't hope and don't fear. Just see the direction see the statistics, the, the problem, everything. See for what it is and find your job in it. Don't just blame the leaders. The leaders are responsible, we know that. But what can you do? And the answer is, if you are in this everyday position, as you are, you can do very little with your material body or material assets because you are not elected as a leader, you cannot affect so many people's lives. You are not a Chebo member with you know, hundreds of you know, millions of dollars or even billions in your <coughs> bank account. But you can do something with your mind. Your mind is not more or less powerful than anyone else in this universe. 
potentially you can wake up just like the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, patriarchs, great monks, great nuns, great lay practitioners. You can wake up just like that. So again, don't try to go through the wall. It will not happen. The wall this time is your karma because you were not born into such a seemingly high class environment that materially you could impact the earth and other people so much. People call it high class, elevated, I call it responsible. Okay? So work with the mind. Find that as a gateway to help. Because if your mind is super wise, compassionate, and awakened, people immediately start to change your attitude, their attitude towards you. Because why? You have changed yours. If your attitude changes, everything changes. But if your mind doesn't change, your attitude also doesn't change. So, likewise, if you are more enlightened and more awakened, you can help more people as you are in your current situation. So work, work with the mind. You don't have money, you don't have power, you don't have big capabilities at the material level, fine, accept it. Most of us are born into that situation. We are not kings, queens, princes or princesses, you know, chamber members, or in the upper 1% of the population. Fine, no problem. But your mind has no high or low. Your mind doesn't have a GDP. So you can have unlimited possibilities. So work with what you have. And everybody has this mind with, with, with which we can work. So work with that and suddenly the daughter who, of a Chebo member, very rich but very problematic, with all kinds of mental afflictions and emotional confusion, finds you in a, in a kukchang during a movie theater performance, just sitting right next to you and you are there with your many months and years of practice radiating something which just turns to you and says, wow, can I talk to you? This is not unheard of. This happens. Because you have something which she doesn't. And then all the wealth, all the power, and everything can totally become different in an instant. Because that person starts to respect you. Because you can help them. Okay. More questions? Last one or two. Back last one. What is more frightening than a nuclear test? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> <laughs> Joke aside. Use your time, use, use the opportunity, and soon we see you next week. Yes? I'm just wondering how, what they how are you doing these things? Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, I can say that from the bottom of my heart, I can look forward towards some very happy changes. For a long time, we have been uh, in doubt whether Hong uh, Kong saw should belong just uh, to a Western Buddhist organization or also to an Oriental Buddhist organization. Uh, I tried to do both when we started, but I was told that I can do only one, either the Western or the Oriental. And through the natural process of evolvement and development and interacting with people, going through many situations, solving many problems, uh, we realized uh, and the Hungarian Sangha voted this spring that we will register Hong Kong Sa in the Korean Buddhist Chogya order as a Sudok Sa branch temple. So if you heard about it, it's true. It's happening. And I'm very happy to say that the registration process has already started. And uh, we are totally in harmony with the Sudok Sa Sunims. Especially, I want to express my sincere appreciation to Pang Jang Sunim. Also, Jujisunim, Jangchun Sa Jujisunim, Songwon Jangsunim, 
Um, these are two pseudonyms, just to make it clear. And, uh, and they are also very helpful and they, they see the far-reaching effects of this decision. So the temple, uh, needless to say, will open uh, to even more people than before. And uh, this is not just an act of faith, it's also an act of appreciation, because largely this temple uh, has been financed by Korean lay donors. So, as you are sitting here, some of you have been long-term supporters, which I really want to appreciate. Some of you have been there already. And I invite you to come and experience the Dharma, which has a, a little bit of a Hungarian taste, but nonetheless, it's 8,000 kilometers far physically, but there is no distance mentally. So I want to invite you, please come and visit us. Let's practice together there. Let us build that big Dharma bridge there so that the Buddha's teaching can flourish where it really has to. And Hungary is one place, and not the only place, where human beings have been missing this Dharma for centuries. And during the short time that it has been you know, present there, we could already see the benefits. And that's why we decided that we build a more or less permanent base there. Nothing is permanent, but this is more permanent than just an apartment. And then we take root there also as a monastic tradition to help and teach everybody and have shorter and longer retreats there together. And that's why we devote a significant amount of energy to make it not only outside Korean style, but carrying the true spirit of Korean Buddhism. So, uh, in a month, we expect that the registration process finishes, and then we become the 79th Malsa of Sudosa, thus staying within Sumsang Sunim's family, which is very important for us. And uh, everybody understands not just the path, but also loyalty to the path and loyalty to those who help you. So now I sincerely want to express my appreciation to all of you who are here and to all the viewers who are watching this and also all the media, including Buddhist Television Network with all the decision makers and the crew members that make this possible. So, Jinshimuro Kamsamas, Nutrimuda. Ladies and gentlemen, this was probably the best closure for today's Dharma talk. I appreciate your presence, your wonderful attention. And I hope to see all of you again, same time, same place, next week. Thank you.